So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so we're going from the large, right, talking about the tumor mass, down to the individual cells. Uh, and as you know, there's two ways to look at this. There's the genomic way, which actually means both DNA and RNA. Uh, and then there's the phenotype, right? The phenotype is actually the sum of all of the genomics, as well as the sum of the epigenetics, which is something which is even not being considered in today's sets of talks uh, in detail. So I've always been interested in the single cell, and I want to understand the biology, not just the surface markers that everybody focuses <laughs> upon usually in terms of staging, but the intracellular signaling events that are actually driving the function of the biology of the tumor. So for a long time, I've been working in flow cytometry and developing methods to look at the uh, intracellular signaling along with surface markers. But the problem, of course, with flow cytometry are the limited number of parameters that you can measure. So we've been on the lookout for a number of years for uh, increasing the parameters on a per cell basis. Uh, and we came across a technology uh, called mass cytometry developed by Scott Tanner at the University of Toronto. He'd approached me to see if we could actually work this uh, technique up for applications in immunology and cancer biology. So the, the essence of the technique is, for those of you who know flow cytometry, we're still looking at the single cell. Right, but rather than using fluorophores uh, on a per cell basis uh, to measure the events of interest via antibodies, we're actually attaching then to those antibodies isotopes uh, that are unique, not found normally in cells. Uh, and then we're using the isotopes uh, after ionization of the cells, passing them through a 7,500 degree Kelvin flame at the rate of about 500 cells per second. Uh, and then the ion cloud that once was the cell goes into the mass spectrometer or cytometer. We're actually counting then the ions that are associated with the antibodies that are associated with the cells. Right, we're counting those up. And that allows us to go up to, well, originally we published about 32 parameters per cell. We're up around 45 or so. And a new set of chelators that we've just made uh, jumps us up to around 50 to 60 parameters on a per cell basis. Okay, so that's the technique. So we usually work with perturbations of the cells. We don't just rely on what the cells look like in the body. Uh, usually, for instance, most immune system cells are in uh, quiescence. We perturb the cells. So it's kind of like asking questions, asking you guys, you know, what do you feel like today? How are you thinking, right? And then depending upon your answer, I can determine whether there's a pathology or not, right? So, uh, and we can actually work out the intracellular signaling diagrams if we measure enough phosphoproteins. The phosphoprotein basal state will be different than the phosphoprotein state in the presence of a drug versus uh, the presence of a signaling input such as a cytokine or a cytokine plus drug. So we use computational techniques then to derive the intracellular network, uh, basically uh, ab initio, out of the raw data. So perturbations give us a lot more. Right? I actually used the joke, uh, perturbations were kind of like um, Dick Cheney was right uh, about interrogations. That usually goes well, uh, goes over well on the West Coast. Doesn't, didn't go well when I gave this talk in Texas. <laughs> so uh, perturbations, cross-linking of the proteins, right? We fix the cells, so the signaling stops, and then the cells are basically uh, usable for months on end if frozen properly. Permeabilize the cell membrane with a detergents and or ethanol, nothing leaks out, uh, at least minimally. We then stain with metal chelated antibodies, uh, and then we attach the uh, isotopes to the antibodies via a chelator cage uh, that has a polycarbon backbone. Multiple isotopes, same isotope, are attached to the chelator. That's then attached via traditional chemistry to the antibodies. Uh, we get around five to six of those, uh, or actually nanoparticles now as well. Uh, and that gives us basically the signal. We then nebulize the cells into single cell droplets. They're passed through the, uh, through the flame. Uh, their uh, ions are then counted. That would be a, an example of an ion cloud down here. This, the system sweeps across the flow of information or ions that are hitting the detector. Uh, and then this would obviously then be something which is a particle, which has multiple of these uh, different isotopes attached to it. Uh, and then the system recognizes that as a cell uh, and then creates the, the single cell information, which is now a multi-parameter. Remember, multi-parameter correlations more important than single and individual, uh, say, Western blots, right, that aren't telling me something about what is co-expressed. It's kind of like driver mutations. You want to know what the driver mutations are in the same cell. You want to know what the driver signaling is in the same cell or the driver marker expression. This is unfortunately where the trouble begins, right? Because it's 40-dimensional information. And, and unless you're Stephen Hawking's, you might have a hard time thinking in 40 dimensions. 
right? So I'll talk about that. Um, so we've spent the last three or four years validating numerous antibodies, surface markers, intracellular proteins, all basically largely actually in my lab focused on cancer. Uh, and so the set that you see there, those intracellular signaling mo molecules, we can run in one experiment, right? We can run those all simultaneously at, on the experiment to look at the cross correlations of all of those markers. Right, along with enough surface markers to look at and call out the tumor cell subtypes, differentiation markers, um, immune cell infiltrates, as I'll show you soon. So we've published on and or are about to publish on a number of different systems for interrogating the information. I won't talk about the DREMI approach with, with Donna Pierre. But this is a wholly new way to draw out information from the single cell um, systems. It's uh, now, I'm told by the editor, in press in science, uh, and that uses the single cell data. But it, it goes well beyond the correlations, and it uses the stochastic information of distributions to pull out information that a simple uh, correlation plot doesn't find. Wanderlust, which is basically finds trajectories of cells that are differentiating automatically, as published in Cell earlier this year. Scaffold, which is an immune system reference map that we're working, the Gates Foundation is funding that. PNAS, which is a paper, which is a, a work that we use to basically, if we have all of these features on all of these cells and we have clinical information on the patients, we can match what the cell populations are that are correlated with the clinical information. And I'll show you an example of that soon. And then VISNI, which is another approach with Donna Pierre, where what we do is we take the cells, we organize them like in a sandbox as if they were marbles, colored marbles, and you organize them in the sandbox according to like near like. And then we can color them like a heat map according to the markers of interest. So, Really what we're doing is we're taking the information about the cells, the surface markers are intracellular events, we're organizing them like any kid would uh, organize things that are similar. We can do this automatically, right? Uh, that works great if you're an ordered, an ordered system, such as the immune system, you can organize these. You can then go in with co computational approaches uh, and mouse over any of those individual dots and look at it in the more conventional way. What are the cells and what are the features that underlie the, the relationships that are here? Um, but the problem is with cancer, right, it's not ordered anymore, right? Something goes wrong with the first cell. And this ends up, as was just shown by the last speaker, into cascading events which expand the search space or the opportunity space of the cancer, such that eventually you no longer have a nice ordered trajectory. In fact, you end up creating all kinds of new uh, subclones and whole new spaces, right? This is the problem of cancer. So can we use any of these techniques to trace any of this? So we started with AML. Uh, and this is work with uh, the Jim Downing at um, St. Jude's, thank you, early in the morning. Uh, healthy donors, uh, pediatric AML, our usual shtick, interrogate with multiple input, read out functional markers as well as enough surface markers to call out the various cell types, organize in the sandbox with Visney according to similarity. So now what you can see are the healthy uh, put together with, uh, computationally, all of the individual patients, patients by color. So the first thing to notice is that it's not a completely disorganized mess. Despite the fact that you've got all these different patients, they're actually found within a relatively limited space, right? In other words, the AML cannot be anything it wants. It's still bounded by its history of what it once was. It still has genetic programs that keep it under control, uh, and it will recapitulate certain orders. It's a distorted order. It's not what you expect from normal hematopoiesis, but uh, it is certainly what uh, an oncologist would look at and say, yeah, I, I see these kinds of things again and again. Of course, if you didn't see them again and again, you'd have nothing to stage patients with. So now we can look at the surface marker expressions across here uh, and early markers going all the way towards late, and you can start to see that although there is heterogeneity, it's still ordered, ordered heterogeneity. I mean, everybody who's perhaps heard me talk before, I hate the word heterogeneity. Um, a uh, synonym is chaos. So to say that you've discovered chaos uh, or you're studying chaos doesn't make any sense. There's order in the heterogeneity, right? So, and the fact that there's order, here's just some examples of some driver mutations, core binding factor, right? Five different patients, all of whom have 
at least that main core binding factor driver, they're only in a limited space, right? They're not everywhere, right? So, the, so and again, as the last speaker just said, that once you have a given mutation, it probably predisposes or predisposi predispositions you to certain successor mutations. It means that you can't do everything that you might want. So we were particularly interested in the um, hematopoietic signaling, not the surface markers, but the intracellular signaling that says, I am an early stem cell. So those are the uh, its principal component space of healthy early stem cells, right? Healthy dendritic cells and healthy monocytes, right? So that's the signaling space in th uh, three component space. Now, if we look at the AMLs, Interestingly, we can find clusters of cells in there that although we know that they're not normal cells, they still actually have the expected features of intracellular signaling that relates to uh, normal stages of, de of development. But the surface markers are nowhere near normal. Right? So if we go back in and we look at the HSPC, this is basically the early progenitor-like markers compared to normal in black, we can see that just the surface markers, these are now the HSP signaling things, things that look like early stem cells, right? We can see that the surface markers are quite different. What does this imply? It implies that we've got two programs going on, right? There's the, there's the what I think I am, the intracellular signaling. There's the differentiation program, which is supposed to be matched. There's a cut, right? There's a discontinuous uh, relationship between the surface markers, which we use to stage, and the intracellular signaling. Now, we can look at different, different individuals, and you can see that the surface markers are all over the map, but the intracellular signaling is the same, right? So here we are staging by surface marker, and yet the intracellular signaling is telling us a wholly different story. We would believe, of course, that the intracellular signaling is what's driving the stem cell phenotypes. So we went in then, uh, we had actually gene expression arrays from all of these patients. We then looked at a signature of not just the surface markers or not the intracellular signaling of what it is that seems to call out these patients. Specifically, these are basically other uh, gene expression pro or other uh, gene uh, profiles in their expression that are correlated with that intracellular signature that I just told you about. The ones in red then are the surface markers uh, that could be used otherwise to look at these cells. Uh, and so not the surface markers that we think of as in differentiation, but these markers actually seem to call out the actual phenotype of the intracellular space. But now if we use some of those uh, markers and then we go back into online databases and look to see if those markers actually call out the outcome for these patients, remarkably they can, right? So we can get beautiful, uh, basically, differences in their, in their outcomes. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about a solid tumor. This is all the work of uh, Dr. Wendy Fantel in my laboratory. She's the driver of this. I'm more a bystander in providing the uh, analytic tools. She's actually a survivor of ovarian cancer herself. Uh, and we commiserate because I'm a six-time survivor of cancer. Uh, I've had multiple melanomas and kidney cancer. Still here. Still kicking. Okay, so we took multiple uh, high-grade ovarian cancers, did mass cytometry. Uh, this is the marker panel that we used, right? Uh, these are the surface markers. These are markers that will call out some of the intracellular EMT biology, proteins related to apoptosis, and sorry, cell cycle. Uh, apoptosis, and then these are transcription factors or Yamanaka factors, stem cell factors, et cetera. Okay, so this data is so hot off the press uh, that we haven't even di uh, gone deeply into it. This is just like last week's data. But this is now an organization of the various tumors and looking at, from 10 of the patients, looking at e uh, And uh, as you can see, something quite interesting is happening uh, in all of these patients that we have where we had the tumor at uh, diagnosis, the one in the relapse, obviously what's happening is that they've gone through their uh, serious transition uh, and that you actually have almost no marker, say, of e on on this organization. But again, remember the AML and I, how, how I told you it was limited? Again, with ovarian cancer, it's limited. We've done as many as 50 
uh, sorry, 25 other ovarian cancers on, in another study. And it, every time you see it, you find that despite the patient, despite the genetics, you have only a limited opportunity or limited number of things that you can become, right? So your options are not unlimited. So again, it's about can we confine, can we figure out which of these cell populations is the key, and can we confine now the tumor just to a limited space so that it doesn't break out into, say, a relapse opportunity, right? So what are some of the other markers that are associated with that relapse? So here's Vimentin, which is a mesenchymal marker. So you can see that obviously this is very, uh, everybody has this, right? Everybody has it to a limited or, or lesser extent, but in the relapse, this guy particularly comes, uh, comes roaring back, right? Um, SNAIL, which is a marker, a transcription factor marker of the EMT transition, it's only in a very small subpopulation of some of these, but notice that in this case, it's particularly, it's, it's in here. But once you've transitioned, you apparently don't seem to need it over here. These are just some one-offs. Um, SOX2 actually is in both sides of the pre and post, right? So suggesting that there are multiple ways to the extent that SOX2 calls out a stem cell, there are multiple ways to have at least that marker's expression. And maybe that means that they actually have the ability to move back and forth uh, between uh, different uh, kinds of stem cells. There they are there, called out. Uh, and then MYC, one of uh, uh, the more interesting markers, given its uh, varied role in cancer, you can see here that this cancer is completely uh, permanently expressing it uh, all over. Now, that's all interesting, and we really haven't had time to dive into uh, a lot of the interesting biology that is already underneath that. But with the advent, of course, of immunotherapies, uh, one can start to ask questions as well about the immune system's infiltrate. So we also have an immune system panel, which overlaps with the biology of the tumor panel, uh, as you can see here. Um, and markers that will call out each of the cell subsets, stromal, tumor, immune system, and angiogenic stromal, so we actually can measure this all at once uh, in the tumor. Um, and the, actually, the big surprise to me, the immune system is blue. You know, everybody always says, oh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, TILs. Maybe there's five of them, right, uh, in, the, in the thing. But look at this. It's the majority of some of these tumors is actually the immune system, right? In other tumors, it's not, right? It's actually a small amount. So this would be, th this, was my this was my understanding before, the, you know, looking at this system deeply. Others might have already known this, but already it's already pretty large. So remember I mentioned that program, Citrus, which lets us look at the features and correlate to clinical outcome. So the first level of the analysis here is, are there immune system uh, features that correlate to particular subsets of the tumor and vice versa? Um, and I'm just going to skip that. Uh, and the answer is yes, and this is only the, the, the first of the, of the analyses. There are particular tumor subsets, so remember that diagram of all of their particular tumor subsets that are with features related to their biology that's correlated to the immune system presence. So basically there's a discussion going on. Somebody is keeping somebody at bay, right, or somebody's dependent on the other uh, individual. And I think that uh, Cornelia's work this morning showed that there's probably, at least within the tumor, there are conversations going across each other. Uh, and here are, those here are those tumor cell subsets. They're teeny. Well, maybe the fact that they're teeny is because the immune system is keeping them small. I don't know. Or maybe there's something else going on yet to be understood. But the phenotypic depth at which we can now analyze these things allows us to uh, begin to ask those kinds of questions. A next big opportunity, of course, is to merge this with genomics. I haven't shown the data, but we can do now as many as 20 RNAs at the single cell level with all of this. And soon we'll be doing DNA as well at the single cell level. And that can actually, that's using um, basically uh, a uh, novel technique that we've developed in the lab, and I'll be talking about it when it's uh, published. I won't go over that. I just want to finish with how can we get to what histologists like. We published this in Nature Medicine earlier this year. Uh, we're using the same isotopes in a different format. Rather than using a CYTOF, we're using a, um, a SIMS, a secondary ion mass spec. Okay, and we've developed this such that we can stain the cells uh, and we can even use archival samples that 
uh, paraffin embedded, et cetera. Stain the samples. We use uh, actually a device over in the geology department, uh, which is about the size of a truck. It's about three tons. Uh, and uh, obviously, we're not going to need that, nor are we expecting to use that in the future. But what it does is it shoots a primary ion beam about 100 nanometer to 200 nanometer resolution at the stage. It knocks off the isotopes. Uh, this is called oxygen dual plasmatron. I think this was named by um, Woody Allen. Uh, from one of his early movies, Sleeper. Um, and then you collect the ions in a magnetic sector. We're actually replacing this with a TOF, uh, and we're going to be, I'll show you something we're going to be doing in a few minutes. Um, this is already a 10D imaging of the tumor. And you don't have to now use enzymes where you're looking at brown and browner, right? And so, but we tricked the reviewers and colored this uh, brown so that they wouldn't argue with us about that we were actually doing this quantitatively. It, it is quantitative. It's highly quantitative. It's like a fax. Actually, you can scan the image. You can get, uh, you can sector out the, the cells and get all the relevant information. This is the new panel that we've devised that's going to be done with the new TOF that we're building, right? Uh, so again, we can bring that many marker uh, measurements to histology. And I want to point out something interesting. So one of the reviewers said, well, uh, you know, how many times, you know, does this destroy the sample? Can you go back and look at the same thing? Um, and so I started asking the postdoc, Mike Angelo, who was doing this, I said, well, OK, well, what do each of those pixels mean? He says, oh, they probably mean it's a single molecule. I'm like, what? You didn't mention this to me before? So when you go down and you look at it, one of the interesting things about this mass spec is that the ion efficiency is 50%, meaning 50% of the ions that are produced are actually collected and seen. Remember, each of those antibodies has about 200 or so isotopes on it, meaning that we're oversampling every single antibody. So if we actually were to do two molecules which are close to each other, right, we could see them as a single pixel overlapping. The depth is only 10 to 20 nanometers. We can make this anything we want just by varying the ion current. We're actually only taking about a 10 nanometer slice. So that's 50 successive slices. So right now, we're doing 100 nanometers. An antibody is about that size there, 14 nanometers. The new device that we're building is going to be 5 to 10 nanometers, right? meaning we'll be able to get voxels that are 5 nanometer to 10 nanometer cubed. Right? That's a molecule by molecule resolution. Calculate that as average cell. You'd have about 9 billion voxels of resolution to look at. What are we going to do with that? We've started uh, with epigenetic measurements. We've, prevent, we've created all the epigenetics and already starting to see things that are interesting co-expressions that nobody would have expected to see before, mark, uh, marker by marker. I'm not interested in whole cell now. I'm interested in modeling the chromatin. So let's say that that were a chromatin, right? Let's say that I had antibodies against each of those, right? We can use DNA to intercalate into the DNA to trace the DNA. Now I've got, a, say, a 5 by 5 or a 10 by 10 voxel. We can actually go through the entire cell molecule by molecule and build up a, an image. That's my goal, right? Done. So that's the objective. We're at about 45 or so parameters now. New ones, we won't talk about that. Messenger RNA can be done down to five copies per cell. We're building immune system reference map. Obviously, being able to get a hold of all of this data allows you to dive deep into the utility of it. There's multiple CYTOFs at camp, on campus already. Um, so this slide, as you can see, uh, I don't put my name up usually. This was uh, stolen from uh, Wendy Fantle. It was actually all of her work was the ovarian. Um, so she's not on here because she, she gave me the slide. But the ovarian cancer, that's the group that she runs in my laboratory. Uh, and hopefully she'll be splitting off soon uh, to take it uh, off by herself. That's Wendy. Uh, I've already spoken about Mike Angelo's work. And I'm not on this slide, Aaron Simmons, who did uh, much of the AML work. And that's the group behind me. Thank you very much. Deathly silence. Questions? Microphone. 
Thank you. Fantastic technique. Can you say something about the cost of analyzing cell by cell if we wanted to know a heterogeneity in a tumor and we gave you a million cells? How much would it cost to analyze that? A thousand dollars. Do you have any data on the um, clinical outcomes with respect to the heterogeneity of these tumors? So the the kind of stuff that Nelly was talking about, more heterogeneous, uh, less heterogeneous, what, comes, what happens? Great question. The answer is no, we don't have that. We do have some data that shows that particular cell subsets uh, amongst the heterogeneity is more telling of the outcome. And so dangerous clones. Yes, exactly. So, uh, Charlie, wait a minute. I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Um, inspiring talk. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, have you looked at all at commensal uh, bacteria, cells of commensal bacteria oh my in the God. tumor? Uh, no, we have not. Although I was having a conversation with somebody else this morning about using certain uh, TLR responses uh, to measure the, the uh, ability, the um, invasion, right, kind of like a sepsis model of what uh, immune systems might be in touch with the uh, with the system, but no, we haven't gone in and looked at the commensals and then correlated that. <laughs> Interestingly, we have done that in an immune model of Salmonella, right, about the commensals. Well, it gets becomes chronic in, in these in situations, but it's an interesting question, and I I, I think the Weisman has some data on it, if we can chat it. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thanks, Gary. Yeah. That's really phenomenal technology. What are the um, storage implications and computer resource you require to analyze this data? I mean, is it something that, you know, a, a small lab can set up and analyze reasonably easily? I mean, it's $1,000, you say, to analyze a million cells. But what about the sort of knock-on effects on storage and computer resource you need to... So a, a company that spun out of my lab by some of the students called Cytobank, actually, um, that grew out of the need to go beyond the traditional software formats that were available. And it does everything uh, that I've shown today absent the Dremi. Um, yeah. And we basically just hand it over to them. And that's it's either available free um, if uh, you want certain features or you, you pay for more of the storage. Um, but it's, it's, it's far from prohibitive. It's like $2,000 a seat or something okay. for as much yeah. as you want to do. Great. Thanks. Nice talk, uh, Gary. Just wanted to ask, have you uh, considered looking at glycans and sugars given their important roles in cancer progression and heterogeneity? There is this problem of mass spec analysis of glycans. Uh, how, how do you envision moving that direction? So if there are um, ligands for any of those sugars, right, as antibodies, they're as good as any other marker you could think of. Uh, and we can measure it either by, by the CYTOF itself or by the MIBI technology. Um, so I, I, in, I would envision no problems. It's all about the ligand. No mass limitations? No mass limitations? I'm or sorry, no what? No mass limitations as far as size of the glycogen? No, no, because you're not measuring the target itself. You're measuring the antibody, antibody. and the isotope on the target. I see. Right. Thank you. Okay. Last question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, in terms of the constraint landscapes uh, that you showed for the ovarian versus melanoma, did you see much overlap or was the extent or type of overlap something you would have predicted or did you see any overlap at all between the two types of cancer? The two types, you mean the, the two Melanoma halves? versus ovarian, for example. No. No, no. overlap mm -mm. whatsoever? No. Okay. And actually related partly to Cornelia's question, um, you know, at a certain point you bump up against this limit of the number of parameters that you can do, but if you think about what you can do in a histologic format, uh, and if we're really down at the level of single molecule resolution, you can think of actually coding multiple isotopes on a per antibody basis. So you can give one antibody three different isotopes uh, that would be different than another one. Sorry, it wasn't Cornelia. Um, and uh, so you can actually do uh, this in uh, as many antibodies you can put on. You can think of doing hundreds of antibodies in a basically a flat format. Okay. Cool. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you.